Hello everybody, welcome back to the Inner Sanctum YouTube channel. I'm your host, Iris Simitakis, and today we're here with episode two of our new little mini-series here ahead of the 2022 FIFA World Cup, the Scouting Centre. Now, as you can tell by the title and the thumbnail, we'll be, going, we'll be going ahead and looking at Australia's second group game against Tunisia. So without further ado, let's get into it. So let's start this video in the same vein as to where we started the France video, and that's by, by looking at how Tunisia like to play. Now, unlike France, Tunisia have used one system pretty much throughout their World Cup qualification campaign. They used this system in the African Cup of Nations tournament earlier this year as well, and that is just a very simple 4-3-3. Now, this 4-3-3 is a very traditional system. It has one slightly more defensive midfielder just ahead of two two more box-to-box -box midfielders. The wingers like to stay slightly more narrow with the fullbacks progressing up. It is a very traditional 4-3-3 system that we've come to see in modern times and it does take a lot of um, it does take a lot of staple structures and staple systems that we've seen from the elite clubs playing this system and they have transferred that into their own game as well but the way that they like to build out from the back is with one of the central midfielders probably the most likely most more often than not I should say the more the central the central central midfielder in in this 433 system likes to drop slightly deeper in between the two center halves to collect the ball and play forward passes almost acting as if almost acting like the sides core quarterback in a sense. This allows, obviously via this system, this allows the two centre-backs to push slightly wider, which in turn then pushes up the full-backs to create a little bit more space going forward. This allows th those, pocket of space, that, those pockets of space that the full-backs do like to occupy is where, the, is where the play likes to go out to next. They do like to play out wide and use their talents out wide um, from this midfield system. Now, the wing, obviously, with, this, with the full-backs occupying more advanced areas, this means the wingers, especially in the final phase of build-up play, like to occupy slightly more central areas and linking up with the striker this creates this creates central overloads and, and allows for more direct football because you have a lot more you have a lot of players in a more concentrated area which means you can hedge your bets with 50 50 tackles more often than not because you've got more players around the ball for that manic style of football now because of this they are very dangerous on the counter-attack because they've got those three players playing relatively narrow and relatively high up the pitch and they and and with this I also like to deploy a very high line especially in possession they like to carry the ball up a little bit and kind of sit in a, in a relatively high line especially in comparison to some other teams in, in the African um, in the African in the African um, confederation I should say um, as well as some other sides of the World Cup you will see Tunisia playing a slightly more higher line than what you potentially may expect for a side of that quality and because of this if they're able to get a quick turnover by pressing really by pressing intensely high up the pitch and squeezing the opposition they obviously can be they can obviously be very very dangerous on the counter attack because they've got those three players in advanced central areas where they can go quickly and directly to now now, as I was touching on just before with their pressing structure, they aren't overly aggressive presses. They aren't like helter skelter style presses. However, they are very intelligent. They they have a good understanding of what areas to press and when to press in. And obviously, we can see this with a um, three 0 win over Japan in the most in one of the most recent friendlies. The most of their goals came about, and their ability ability to dominate that game came about from being very intelligent with the way that they pressed, and obviously getting those quick turnovers high up the pitch and being able to go very directly and very vertically. Now, as as I said with that front three, front three, not only they like to maintain a slightly more central area. They like to maintain their depth as well. Now this obviously obviously works with their pressing structure because they obviously have they maintain that depth high up the pitch. Meaning if they can get that quick turnover, they can go ver they can go very quickly high up the pitch with with those three players. You have pushed that back line relatively deep. Now the way that they like to attack generally, especially in clean possession, is through long balls. Whether those long balls are out wide or up to those three more narrow forwards, this is the way that they do like to play. They, however, in saying this, they are very very patient with it. They aren't kind of high tempo direct football. They are slightly more standard and low tempo and then they go direct. They have the technical ability, especially in their midfield players as well as a defensive third, to pass a ball around the back and really and really play with their food a little bit before they are able to go up before they go along to their strikes and to those forward players. They don't rush things, they don't force the issue. They 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 don't force the issue. They like to be very patient with possession, especially in the midfield and defensive third, because they have the technical ability in the, in the players in those positions to do that before they then find the space they are very patient they wait for the correct runs they wait for, they wait for the correct spaces to be present before that's when they go up uh, that's when before that's when they go very long and direct because because of their obviously long and direct nature they do rely a little bit on individual brilliance they don't really have a lot of structure once they get into the final third however they do have a lot of pace and skill in those front line in those front players as well as someone like Awabi Kazri who will be their main man um, who's been obviously covered a lot when, when people speak about Tunisia he will be their main 
main man. He's a fantastic finisher and obviously a brilliant, a brilliant playmaker as well. So they have the pace and skill up front to kind of allow themselves to play a very laissez-faire style structure in the final third where they're able to just use those players that they've got, use the pace, use the skill, and exploit the team's defenses through individual brilliance rather than breaking them down systematically. So let's touch on this Tunisian side without the ball and their defensive tactics. Now, Tunisia are a side that will need to be very defensively solid. And if you look at their most recent results, maybe barring their most recent friendly against Brazil, and if you look at their most recent continental tournament, you can see that this is something that Tunisia will be looking to do and will be looking to will be looking to implement heading into the World Cup. Their, de- their defensively solid nature doesn't necessarily come with a very defensively minded system, and that's something we'll touch on, touch on in a little bit. It just comes from being very, very disciplined and what they are able to do. Now, this Tunisian defense will need to be very careful when it comes from passes pa- passes played through their, defensive, through their defensive line as well as over the top. Like we spoke about in their in-possession tactic, they are they do set up in a high defense, in a relatively high defensive line to something that um, you may expect from this Tunisian side. They do sit relatively high, so of course those balls in behind, those balls in between the lines will be, will be a major threat for Tunisia and that is something that they will probably need to adapt their defensive structure in order to avoid heading into the tournament. Now, the main area of the pitch that they do like to defend is that midfield third. Now, this comes through their high defensive line, squeezing the opposition and not and being very, very compact in where in their areas of where they like to defend. Of course, this 4-3-3 system in possession obviously sets up as either a 4-1-4-1, a 4-5-1, or even a 4-4-2 in possession. At court, and this obviously changes to how this obviously changes accordingly to the way the opposition sets up, the way where the opposition strengths are, and what they are able to do with, with the ball um, in possession for the opposition. Now, of course, the, the, the 4 four one four one and the four one four one and the four five one are the two defensive tactics which you will probably see more often when it comes to Tunisia. And of course, this goes back to the whole squeezing and um, being relatively sitting up with a high line, but also squeezing the opposition, being very compact and sitting within maybe a twenty meter between a twenty meter range from the from the front line and the, and the defensive line, being really really compact and squeezing the opposition in. Now, when they play in this four one four one or four five one system, the midfield three in that 4-3-3 system sit very narrow and very compact and they move laterally across the pitch as a unit. Now what this allows is it allows for players, it allows for those three players to press and hunt almost as, as one collective group, which obviously creates fantastic pressing traps for Tunisia and, and, and doesn't allow them and doesn't allow the opposition to play through Tunisia because you have all that you have these three midfielders who stay very compact, press as a unit and are very, very hard to break down. Now they move in this swarm towards the ball carrier, which is obviously very intimidating. Something that the that the ball that the ball carrier will obviously will be very very hard to get past these three players running at running at him and putting him under a lot of pressure. Now what now what this does is that once once the um, once the opposition are in this, once the opposition can kind of break through this in a sense, they do like to drop back in their position in a sense. So once the first layer of, of Tunisia's press is broken, they do like to drop back in that position just ahead of the defense and really sit very narrow and compact. That's when they aren't pressing. So when they're in the pressing stage, they are very they are very m- mobile. They do like to move laterally and be, be very aggressive pressers. However, when they aren't in their pressing stage, they do like to they do like to drop slightly deeper and they do like to maintain their shape. Now, of course, in this system, the wingers from those from that four three three system like to drop back alongside this the, alongside the central midfielders, and obviously the, the the back four hold their shape. Now the gap, the gap between the midfield and the defence is obviously very very tight. They don't allow space in behind for in between the lines for the opposition to to create. So any number tens or like any attacking midfielders that Tunisia will come up against won't have a lot of space to play in between the lines because that gap between that midfield and that defence is very very tight. It's very very Compact. And once again, this goes to show just how tight and just how compact Tunisia will be looking to be, will be looking to to deploy in a sense that that very tight and compact tactic slightly further up the pitch. What, rather than being defensively compact and being defensively tight in a low block, they like to set up in a pretty high, maybe a high mid block. I wouldn't go as far as to say it's a high block and a high pressing block. I would say that it's probably a more more aggressive mid block. So this is obviously a very very strange system. 
and obviously a very very um it's a very weird system that aside who with not a lot of world class quality to to deploy but this is something that Tunisia have played um in in their most recent obviously in the most recent um continental tournament as well as the African um African obviously the African Cup of Nations tournament I should say and of course their most recent World Cup qualifiers as well this is the system that they did that they have played and furthermore another t- another interesting um, si- um aspect of this defensive system is that it works as a unit so when 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 one player presses really high on their man they obviously they have a lot of players to come back and cover normally that will be one of the midfield three so if the wing if the fullback presses really high to man up to man up a winger who's dropped slightly deeper or to press really aggressively one of those one of the central midfielder will drop back and maintain that four at the back system so out of possession it's still it's still it's very compact very disciplined however they do have this understanding of where they when they need to press where they need to press what areas of the pitch they need to do it in however with the pace that they will be versing at the world cup with the quality of some of the players that they will be playing against at the world cup this Tunisian defense will, will need to be very very disciplined in order not to concede a whole lot of goals and really it really finish the game before it, before it's even started so let's move on to a potential lineup that Tunisia will be looking to play for the game against Australia now this system will probably be the same for all three of their group games and obviously this is the lineup right here I'm not going to pronounce any of the names in the in the pr- protecting myself for because I'm probably going to butcher most of them but the main obviously the main cog in this team and the main feature of this team especially in possession is Elias Kiri obviously he's that more defensively central central midfielder in a sense in this 4-3-3 system he's that player that will more likely or not drop in between the two center halves and be that real quarterback that we spoke about in their in possession tactic and of course those two wingers will drop back and will will be in line with that um will be in line with that midfield with that midfield three to create that 4-5-1 system or a like Shkiri will drop deeper to create that 4-1-4-1 system so obviously Wabi Kazri up front will be Tunisia's main man he will obviously be the man that a lot of people will be looking towards when they do watch Tunisia and of course something that Graham Arnold for the Socceroos will be will be needing to ice will be will be needing to isolate the dangers of him and try and get him out um try and restrict his influence in the game as much as possible but yeah this is this this is the lineup that Tunisia will probably um go with for the game against Australia unless they do something which is more game specific then of course we'll just have to wait and see but um yeah this 4-3-3 system it's very very systematic very um very traditional in a sense and yeah this is the lineup that Tunisia will probably play for this for the game against the Socceroos. So let's move on to Australia and what they will be looking to do in order to win this game. Now, as we t- as we did in the Friends video, let's look at three avenues f- for victory um, for the Socceroos for this game against Tunisia. And the first one isn't something tactically, isn't something that will be on the pitch. Um, in a sense, it is the mentality of the Socceroos players and in, in specifically the complacency. Now, of course, this will probably be one of the first times potentially ever that the Socceroos could go into a World Cup match as favourites. Now, this is obviously something that, that obviously is going to be very very different to what the Socceroos um, players will probably have ex- have experienced in the past. Of course, when we take a look at their most recent competitive games, the game against the UAE was relatively close in terms of who was favourites. Both teams it really could have gone either way. Both teams had a merit in order to label themselves favourites. And of course, in their game against Peru, that Peru were of course the favourites in that game. And the Socceroos were able to fight from underneath as the underdogs and get the job done in that game. Of course, in their first group game against France, France will undoubtedly go in into that game as favourites. So this, if if especially if Australia are able to get a result against France, they could and probably should go into this match as favourites. And this is something that they will need to tackle a little bit differently to how they've tackled other games in the past. Now, going into a game as a favourite and going into it as an underdog is completely different in terms of the mentality side of things. Your preparation will be different. And this is something that the Socceroos players can't let can't like get let them let get on top of them. They need to be able to have the same mindset that they've had in their previous games, the same mindset that they had in the France game, and not let this favourites tag that they could have heading into this game get to their heads. They need to they need to maintain that everyone against us or that world against us mentality that will obviously be present against France and probably was present against the Peru and potentially even the UAE as well. So without even looking at tactics, without even looking at some potential lineups, the mentality of the soccer side heading into the game against Tunisia needs to be absolutely perfect otherwise Tunisia definitely have the ability to to crush any team who are, who even give them a sniff so the Socceroos cannot be complacent in the slightest and it'll take this game equally as serious as, a, as what they will do for France and Denmark so let's move on to the second avenue for victory for the Socceroos in this game against Tunisia and that is directness now directness especially in behind now of course we've covered Tunisia's probably main Achilles heel in the sense is those balls in behind those 
versing teams with a lot of pace and a lot of directness in behind. This is something that Tunisia have struggled with in the past and will probably struggle with at the World Cup. So Australia need to be able to exploit that Tunisian weakness, which is, of course, our very high line. This would probably mean starting players like Abel Mabil, Martin Boyle, or even Jamie McLaren, who is a very um, direct striker, likes to get the balls in behind. And and Australia needs to do this from minute one. They need to be able to, to catch Tunisia off guard and really go direct and go with and go quickly from the first minute. Of course, they need to do this as well very quickly when they get in possession. They can't allow Tunisia to sit back into that low block and suffocate the game. So Australia, if they if they were to if they are going to break Tunisia down, it needs to be very early both in the game and it needs to be very early within their phase of build up. They can't be patient and play around with the ball in their midfield third because then Tunisia will slowly slowly just drop back into that more into that very compact and very hard to break down space. Of course, they are very intelligent pressers as well. So if you hold the ball for too long, Tunisia will capitalize on any misplaced pass or any pass that is slightly any pass that isn't perfect. Tunisia will nine times out of ten will capitalize on that on that misplaced pass. So Australia need to be very direct. They need to be very quick with their with ball or with the ball in possession, and they need to be able to exploit that Tunisian weakness, which is of course um, that that ball in behind. And furthermore, this also can be done in transition. Tunisia Tunisia obviously do like to play play a play around with the ball a little bit. They are pretty patient in their build up play, like we touched on um, a little bit uh, a little bit um, before um, with the in possession tactic. So if you're able to press relatively high, press aggressively, and turn the ball over in in the final third, in the middle third, then you can go quickly with a di- with those direct balls in behind, and that that's when you'll be able to catch Tunisia out. And that is the main avenue for goals for this game for the for the Socceroos in this game against Tunisia. So let's move on to the third key avenue for success for this game against Tunisia for the Socceroos, and that will be tactical flexibility. Now, as we've touched on with Tunisia, they are very flexible, especially out of possession with what tactics and what structures they can deploy. Of course, the 4-5-1, the 4-1-4-1, and the 4-4-2 are all um, defensive tactics that Tunisia have been known to play um, in in their most recent games and against games or in games against slightly better opposition. So Australia will be will will need to, and Graham Minor will 100% be willing to, will be needing to adapt in in game and have that game management about him to change if things aren't working. So if he starts McLaren and he can't get space in behind, he will need to he will need to bite the bullet and bring on someone like a Duke or someone like a Cummings, a different type of striker. If our Mobile on the right hand side or on the left hand side isn't working, he needs to be able to make those changes. He needs to be bold in his team selection and he needs to be bold in his in game management as well. Because Tunisia are a very flexible team. They are very they are a very adaptable team. So if things aren't if things aren't going their way within the first 15 to 20 minutes, they'll be able to change that system and obviously try and get the game back on their terms. So Graham Mons will be need, will need to we need to look at that and then obviously make changes accordingly. He can't rest on his laurels. He can't expect to play the same way for 90 minutes and expect to get a result, especially if Australia don't take the lead within the first half or even with within the first hour. He will he will need to be he will need to be able to have the have the um have the bottle in a sense to make drastic changes to that team both personnel wise and tactically. So even if that goes to even if that means he should move to a three at the back system at some point throughout the game, he needs to be able to bite the bullet and do that because. Tunisia are a team that will adapt very, very quickly. They do have a lot of defensive systems in their repertoire. So Australia need to be able to try and play a little bit more unpredictable football, catch Tunisia off guard with something that they won't be able to expect. And that obviously will come within that in-game management. And of this tactical flexibility is going to be something that the Socceroos will need to have on point for this game against Tunisia. So let's move on to a predicted lineup or a potential lineup that the Socceroos could go with in this game against Tunisia. And as you can tell, it is slightly different to the lineup that we had against the against France. Of course, the main the main changes in this team is that Nathaniel Atkinson replaces Frank Karacic at right back. Adrian Hustic replaces Cam Devlin in the center central center of midfield and moves to a slightly more advanced position. Of course, Martin Boyle and Awa Mobile obviously occupy the wing occupy the wings. Jason Cummings up front with the rest of the with the rest of the back four. Um, who I didn't mention, obviously, Kyle Rouse, Harry Suter, Aziz Bacher, Matt Ryan, as well as Aaron Moy, Jackson Irvine, all remain the same from those two games. Now, I think it's fair to say that Matt Ryan, Aaron Moy, Adrian Hustic, Kyle Rouse, Martin Boyle, Harry Suter, and Aziz Bage all pick themselves. I think they are very, very, they are pretty much locks for this Australian team for almost all three of those games. Going with someone like a Jackson Irvine, Irvine over Cam Devlin, Irvine, Irvine offers slightly more of an offensive ability. We all saw um, he, did, he did hit the score sheet for the game for the Socceroos in that game against the UAE. 
three, so he is able to break through with those third man runs and get in between the lines and create have a little bit more of an offensive um, impetus there. It also allows for Moy to occupy slightly more defensive positions and act as almost like a quarterback for the Socceroos without having Devlin next to him who could suffocate his space and occupy the space that Moy would like to offer. This allows him to dictate dictate the tempo a lot more and gives him gives him a way to be more influential in the game. Furthermore, this obviously allows Adrian Hustic to be slightly more advanced. Um, obviously, obviously having that defensive, having that slightly more defensive, slightly more offensive defensive pr- uh, protection, if that makes any sense, with Irvine occupying a slightly more advanced position, but obviously being very capable defensively. This gives Hustic the freedom to occupy those spaces slightly ahead of that midfielder to occupy as like a as like a final third fulcrum in a sense where the whole play can build off. Choosing Alan Mobile on the left hand side of a Craig Goodwin, Mobile is slightly more direct in terms of cutting in terms of a goal scoring threat and obviously and obviously cutting in on his right on his right foot is, is going to be something that the Socceroos will be looking to um will be looking to will be looking to do in this game against Tunisia. He's uh, he's also slightly more interchangeable and can swap with Boyle he can swap wings with, with Martin Boyle a little bit more effect a little bit more effectively if if that is needed. That is something that obviously we spoke about with the Tactical flex flexibility, our our mobile offers that, and obviously his directness with his pace, obviously slightly more, um, slightly more quicker, especially off the off a couple of yards. He's he's very he's lightning quick, has fantastic agility and close cro- in close control ability. So this this directness and this pace will be a lot will be very very valuable in this game. Um, obviously Atkinson over Karacic, Atkinson slightly more offensively, um, slightly more offensively capable. Obviously we we spoke about Frank Karacic in the game against France. He obviously slightly more defensively, um adept at, at in in that right back role so he probably is more suited to the game against France and Atkinson is probably more suited to this game um, against Tunisia where Australia will be looking to dominate the ball a little bit more he obviously has a fantastic ability to carry the ball um can can drop into into midfield as well he plays an inverted wing back as well so his flexibility that he has in that right back role as well as his fantastic ability to carry the ball forward is going to be something that um that Frank Karadzic doesn't offer and something that will be very, very valuable in this game. And going with Jason Cummings up up front over someone like a Mitchell Duke or Jamie McLaren, I did speak about this slightly just before. Uh, if, if Jamie McLaren did start this game, it wouldn't come as a surprise to me because he's a little bit quicker than Jason Cummings. He does have that directness in behind um, more than Jason Cummings. However, I just think he Jason Cummings is slightly more in form, offers... He offers a little bit more of a well-rounded and a well-rounded game and can do a little bit more without the ball and obviously with the ball he can drop deep, act, act as a playmaker and what have you. Although if McLaren did start, I don't think that would be the worst thing in the world because he does have that pace, that directness in behind, and that's obviously the main staple of his game to get in behind the in behind that defense. And Tunisia will give him a lot of space to work if that is the case. So yeah, that is the predicted lineup for the Soccer Roos for this game against Tunisia. So yes, thank you all very much for watching another video here on the Inner Sanctum YouTube channel, episode 2 of the Scouting Center where we touched on Tunisia. Make sure you leave your thoughts in the comment section below. Leave your thoughts about what about what Australia should do for this game against Tunisia, where Australia can really make, make that impact and leave your predicted lineups and your predicted result in the comment section below. Make sure you subscribe to the Inner Sanctum YouTube channel, like the video. See you guys next time, man. Goodbye.